Welcome to The Extra Dimension, the show where we explore ways technology intersects with other parts of our lives, which we like to call the technological convergence. I am your host, Ian R. Buck, and today we have a really special episode because we've got something brand new that we just launched on the network. Uh, I have been working on putting together a, an audiobook for quite a while. If you'll remember a year ago, the episode of The Extra Dimension from January of 2018, that was an audio adaptation of my senior seminar paper. And uh, the reason that I did that was because I wanted to practice recording a previously you know, written uh, work and adapting it into an audio format. Uh, and the reason that I wanted to do that was because way back, if you'll remember all the way back in August of 2017 when we published our post-scarcity episode, um, that was a fantastic episode by the way. I love the episodes that are about topics that I previously did not know anything about and then I get to go and do a bunch of fascinating research to find out about them. Um, And part of that research, uh, I was reading a book titled Robots Will Steal Your Job, But That's Okay. And I was very taken with, with, the, with the book. Um, and I found myself wishing that there was an audiobook version of it so that I could, you know, do the research faster while I was, like, commuting and stuff and I wouldn't have to sit down and just read. Um, but th- there wasn't a, a, uh, an audiobook available for it. Um, fortunately, though, the book is released under a Creative Commons license And I thought to myself, well, I know how to record audio, I know how to edit audio, maybe I have the right skill set to make this into an audiobook. And so that's exactly what we're doing. I am recording this audiobook, editing it, and publishing it, um, and I'm putting it up initially as a podcast feed, because one, that's what I know, I I know how to do podcast feeds. Uh, Number two, it's not too unusual for this book because uh, back when Federico was first like publishing the book, he actually published it one chapter at a time on his website as like essentially a blog before the final like EPUB and PDF and printed versions came out. Um, so it's already kind of structured in a way that that is appropriate for that. And also, uh, this means that I don't have to record all of the chapters all at once and get it all going you know i can i can uh bite off a little bit at a time instead of you know doing my usual like just taking more than i can chew frankly um so uh yeah for the for the next like 17 weeks or so uh we'll have new chapters of of robots will steal your job coming out um here on the extra dimension I wanted to give you guys a little uh, preview of what that's gonna sound like so I've got the first few chapters uh, here in this episode of the extra dimension for you Uh, if you want to continue listening to the book after that uh, you'll have to go and look for robots will steal your job in your favorite podcast player uh, or you can look for them on our website thenexus.tv and with that let's jump into the book Introduction. You are about to become obsolete. You think you are special, unique, and that whatever it is that you are doing is impossible to replace. You are wrong. As we speak, millions of algorithms created by computer scientists are frantically running on servers all over the world with one sole purpose. Do whatever humans can do, but better. These algorithms are intelligent computer programs, permeating the substrate of our society. They make financial decisions, they predict the weather, they predict which countries will wage war next. Soon, there will be little left for us to do. Machines will take over. Does that sound like some futuristic fantasy? Perhaps. This argument is proposed by a growing, yet still fringe community of thinkers, scientists, and academics, who see the advancement of technology as a disruptive force, which will soon transform our entire socioeconomic system forever. According to them, the displacement of labor by machines and computer intelligence will increase dramatically over the next few decades. 
Such changes will be so drastic and quick that the market will not be able to abide in creating new opportunities for workers who have lost their jobs, making unemployment not just part of a cycle, but structural in nature and chronically irreversible. It will be the end of work as we know it. Most economists disregard such arguments. Many of them don't even address the issue in the first place. And those who do address this issue claim that the market always finds a way. As machines replace old jobs, new jobs are created. Thanks to the ingenuity of the human mind and the need for growth, markets always find a way, especially in the ever-connected and globalized market we live in today. In this book, I will try to avoid picking either side based on belief, gut feeling, or hunch. Rather, I will attempt to engage in informed logical reasoning based on the evidence we have so far. The book is divided into three parts. First, we will explore the topic of technological unemployment and its impact on work and society. I chose to focus on the U.S. economy, but the same argument applies to most of the industrialized world. In the second part, we will look into the nature of work itself and the relationship between work and happiness. The last part is a bold attempt to provide some practical suggestions on how to deal with the issues presented in the first two parts. Doing a thorough examination of each section would require a monumental effort, possibly resulting in thousands of pages, far exceeding the purpose of this book. My intention is not to write a complete academic report, but rather to initiate a discussion about what I think will soon be one of the biggest challenges that we have to face as a society and as individuals. Too often we treat various issues as separate subjects, not realizing the interconnected nature of our reality. This mistake has made us weak and vulnerable. Over the last 70 years, we have set the stage for our own demise. We have become increasingly discontent, the quality of our relationships have diminished, and we have lost track of what really matters. Today, as the comedian Louis C.K. has noted, everything is amazing and nobody is happy. It is time to take a step back and think about where we are going. Let us begin the journey. Chapter 1. Unemployment Today We usually get a sense of how good or how bad things are by reading the news and by looking at the world around us. We see how we live, we talk to our neighbors, we read newspapers, blogs, tweets, and watch TV. Very few people find the time to check for themselves the long and boring tables from the OECD Factbook or the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. The business columns in newspapers are often filled with financial jargon, which does not really encourage a clear understanding to those who are not familiar with the intricacies of the economic system. As a result, most people do not have a clue about what is really going on. A quick glance at the recent statistics about job growth in the United States and in Europe should make us a bit concerned, to say the least. In July 2011, the U.S. government released a report showing that 117,000 new jobs had been created that month, and the New York Times featured a promising headline, U.S. posts stronger solid growth in July, reference one. But an ugly truth was hidden behind this veil of false hope. A growth of 117,000 jobs was not even enough to make up for the population growth, about 130,000 people every month, let alone to make a dent in the 12.3 million jobs lost during the 2008-2009 to recession. Later in the article, we discover a few more things. The official figure for the unemployment rate was 9.1%, which is already staggeringly high but it gets even more concerning when considering that an additional 8.4 million people were working part-time because they could not find a full-time job, and 1.1 million had become so discouraged that they had stopped looking for work altogether. If we include these people, the broader measure of unemployment was 16.1% in July 2011. Please take a moment and let that sink in. The United States of America possibly the wealthiest country in the world, had an unemployment rate at 16.1% as recent as July 2011. As if that was not enough, it turns out that only 58.1% of the population was working, the lowest level in nearly three decades, reference two. Laura DeAndrea Tyson, professor at the Haas School of Business at the University of California, Berkeley, calculated that even if we could somehow create 208,000 new jobs per month, every month for the foreseeable future, it would still take until 2023 to fill that gap, reference three. 
In January 2012, thanks to massive efforts from both the private sector and the government, the unemployment rate fell to 8.3 percent. Reference 4. A very mild consolation, considering that people employed part-time for economic reasons, marginally attached to the labor force, discouraged workers, and the long-term unemployed changed very little over the year. To make things even worse, the labor force participation rate is 63.7%, its all-time lowest since 1983, when women had not entered the workforce in large numbers, and it is dropping consistently every year. Reference 5. MIT economists Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee make a lucid analysis of this problem in their book Race Against the Machine, How the Digital Revolution is Accelerating Innovation, Driving Productivity, and Irreversibly Transforming Employment and the Economy, Reference 6, which deals with the current unemployment crisis and tries to offer some solutions, particularly by reforming education, the system of economic incentives, and by promoting entrepreneurship. While I concur with their analysis, I think their solutions are limited to the way things have worked until now. They appear to be assuming that the system of economic incentives, what drives people, and human nature itself are almost immutable. According to Voltaire, work spares us from three evils, boredom, vice, and need, and having a job has undoubtedly been the driving force to combat them up until now. However, I challenge the assumption that this is the only way we can do that, and we shall explore why in the coming chapters. Other authors have addressed the same issue. Jeremy Rifkin was one of the first to seriously consider this problem. In 1995, he published The End of Work, The Decline of the Global Labor Force and the Dawn of the Post-Market Era, Reference 7, where he predicted that worldwide unemployment would increase as information technology eliminates tens of millions of jobs in the manufacturing, agricultural, and service sectors. He traced the devastating impact of automation on blue-collar, retail, and wholesale employees. While a small elite of corporate managers and knowledge workers reap the benefits of the high-tech world economy, the American middle class continues to shrink and the workplace becomes ever more stressful. Reference 8. While he may have gotten some of the details wrong, the general outline is so spot-on that it seems almost prophetic. Over the past 20 years, we have witnessed the gradual disappearance of the American middle class with rising costs and lower income, references 9 and 10, while the wealthiest Americans have accumulated more wealth than ever before in history. To get an idea of the disproportionate amount of wealth generated by the system, how unevenly distributed it is, and exactly how it had steadily become worse since 1979, let us look at the following graphs, reference 11. As you can see from figure 1.1, average household income had remained pretty much the same for well over 80% of the population, while the top 1% experienced a tremendous increase, particularly starting in 1994. Even more revealing is the change in share of income calculated after taxes. Figure 1.2, change in share of income 1979 to 2007 calculated after taxes. The lower 80% have actually seen a substantial decrease of income, while the very top has hardly been affected. What is even more worrying is the distortion in the public perception of this phenomenon, even after the worldwide Occupy movement broke out. A 2011 paper by Harvard professor Michael Norton and Duke University professor Dan Ariely called Building a Better America, One Wealth Quintile at a Time, shows just how skewed our perception is. Reference 12. Figure 1.3. A Harvard business professor and a behavioral economist recently asked more than 5,000 Americans how they thought wealth is distributed in the United States. Most thought that it's more balanced than it actually is. Asked to choose their ideal distribution of wealth, 92% picked one that is even more equitable. History proved Rifkin right. The middle class is disappearing, the richest are getting richer, and we have no idea how bad the situation truly is. The question is, was Rifkin right about work and automation too? Martin Ford followed up on this, utilizing his entrepreneurial and software engineering perspective. His 2009 book, The Lights in the Tunnel, Automation, Accelerating Technology, and the Economy of the Future, aims to show how automation will inevitably lead to structural unemployment and millions of people, both skilled and unskilled workers, will soon find themselves out of the workforce, with little to no chance of getting back in. 
Ford has since written many articles on major news websites, thereby bringing the issue of technological unemployment back into the public eye. He was also a source of inspiration to me when I decided to write this book. However, as with Brynjolfsson's book, I do not think his solutions are feasible, nor in most cases desirable. All of these authors have identified a real problem, and they've tried to propose viable solutions to that problem using their knowledge, skills, analysis, and background. But as I read their books, I felt there was something missing. Something was not accounted for. I felt they were trying to find solutions in a context where solutions were nowhere to be found. Before I continue, let us be clear on something. All of the authors I just mentioned are highly qualified and intelligent professionals, with much more academic and working experience than myself. That is not in question. But they were not born into a culture where things changed dramatically in just a few years. They had to adapt to the idea of rapid change. They were not born in a generation that created this massive accelerating change. I was lucky enough to be part of that generation. I have seen the free and open source movement rise and become one of the greatest forces on the planet. The dreams I had when I was a child of small groups of dedicated and intelligent people changing the world have come true. It has been exhilarating to witness these events, which are becoming even more ubiquitous, as their rampant increase terrifies the establishment and excites the revolutionaries. Perhaps I am wrong, and all of this comes from my arrogant, blissful ignorance of youth, but perhaps there is something true that transcends me as an individual and speaks through me. It is the collective intelligence of all the people I have spoken with, all the books I have read, the experiences I've had in the ever-connected cybernetic organism known as the Internet. I do not pretend to be the voice of my generation, or that of the entire web for that matter. But it is undeniable that these intelligences have shaped me, influenced me, and directed me over the years. And now I am simply remixing what I received. This is social evolution. Copy, transform, and combine. Reference 13. However, there is also another possibility. It is entirely conceivable that we are all wrong, myself and those authors. Mainstream economists and analysts could be right. It may be that we do not understand some basic economic concepts and that our analyses are nothing more than a fallacy, which could be easily solved by getting our economics right and by studying the past a little bit more. After all, we have seen unemployment fluctuate up and down for hundreds of years, only to go back to familiar levels, without any substantial change in the structure of the economy. As new technologies come along, we cyclically move from one sector to another, creating new jobs, and everything works just fine. Economists have a name for this phenomenon, which takes us back a long time. So, before I go any further, let me tell you a story. Chapter 2. The Luddite Fallacy we are in England at the end of the 18th century. A boy named Ned Ludd is a weaver from the village of Anstey, just outside Leicester. He does not know it yet, but he is about to make history. It is a hard and laborious day in 1779. Ludd is apprenticed to learn framework knitting, but he is averse to confinement or work and refuses to exert himself. His master is displeased and complains to a magistrate, who orders a whipping. In response, Ludd grabs a hammer and demolishes the hated frame. This act will be told by generations to come, and Ludd became history. Or so the story goes. As with every myth, there are many variations of the story. Some accounts say that Ludd was told by his father, a framework knitter, to square his needles. Ludd took a hammer and beat them into a heap. Other stories can be found, and nobody really knows which one is true, if any. Reference 1. Whether or not any of it really happened is irrelevant. What matters is that news of the incident, like every good folk story, was spread and distorted. Whenever frames were sabotaged, people would jokingly say, Ned Ludd did it. His actions inspired the folkloric character of Captain Ludd, also known as King Ludd or General Ludd, who became the alleged leader and founder of a movement called, not surprisingly, the Luddites. The Luddites can be traced back to Nottingham, England, around 1811. It was composed mostly of hosiery and lace workers, English textile artisans, who protested against the changes produced by the Industrial Revolution, often by destroying mechanized looms. They smashed knitting machines that embodied new labor-saving technology as a protest against unemployment. Simply put, machines were sealing their jobs, and they did not like where that was going. 
people began to speculate whether this was the beginning of an irreversible process or if things would go back to normal. At the time, automation was represented by no more than a steam engine machine, something that could have hardly been seen as a realistic replacement for human labor in general. However, some suggested that the problem of machine automation could exacerbate in a few years, putting the very companies that produced goods at risk. Industrialist Henry Ford understood this quite profoundly. In fact, he paid his workers twice the going rate so that they could afford to buy the cars that they themselves were producing. Reference to. This makes sense. You need people to have enough money to buy the products you create, otherwise the cycle of production consumption is interrupted. If automation replaces humans faster than they can find new occupations, you have a problem. As a result, people may get upset and start to jeopardize machines in order to ensure their workers not lose their job. To this day, we call these people Luddites. Neoclassical economists have dismissed such proposition as nonsense. They claim that this argument is a fallacy. Economist Alex Tabarrok famously said in 2013, If the Luddite fallacy were true, we would all be out of work because productivity has been increasing for two centuries. Reference 3. And if you look around you, it would seem that the Luddite argument is indeed a fallacy. By studying the historical record, one should be pretty optimistic about the future of the economy. Automation and mechanization have consistently been introduced, and that led to an increase in productivity. More work could be made with less labor. More products were coming out of our factories. More wealth was generated. But the total requirement for labor did not decrease. As the economy grew, so did our standard of living. And our perception of what is necessary for a comfortable life changes accordingly. A hundred years ago, even the richest man in the world could not even dream of owning a small electronic device that could connect him to whomever he liked anywhere in the world. Today, not owning a cell phone is inconceivable to most people. Even in the poorest countries, people have access to cell phones. A boy in a village in rural Africa with a cell phone, you would be surprised of how many of them do, has access to more information than the President of the United States did 20 years ago. Some have gone so far as to argue that the poorest of today are richer than the richest kings of the past. I would not agree with that because many times it is cheaper to obtain these technological marvels than it is to find food. You get the idea. Over the past two centuries, we have continued to rely on machines to increase our productivity, but we have not been displaced by them. On the contrary, we created new jobs, new sectors, and new opportunities. Machines allowed us to become more creative, more productive. As we moved from the agricultural to the manufacturing sector and then to the services, we began to expand our domination of the planet. So if the idea that automation creates unemployment is a fallacy, then there is nothing to worry about. The staggering rate of unemployment that we are experiencing today in 2012, 8.2% in the US, 24.1% in Spain, 21.7% in Greece, 14.5% in Ireland, reference 4, is just one of the many cycles of the economy. Or it may be due to bad policies, or bad politicians, or the financial bubble of subprime mortgages that burst a couple of years ago. Maybe it is a combination of all of them. If that is the case, then we just need to elect better politicians, demand better reforms, and reduce the influence of the financial sector on the economy. In other words, it could be just a matter of time before things get back to normal. Get back on your feet, work hard, and everything will be fixed. I would like to believe that. I really would. But the reality may be very different. While these resolutions are certainly good ideas, and they are necessary for creating a better society in which to live, they might not be sufficient. In fact, it might be that no matter how hard we try, how good the new wave of politicians will be, how resourceful our businesses are, or how ingenious we can be, we will never escape from this crisis. We do not know if that is the case. But it is a possibility one that we should carefully consider and explore. Kurt Vonnegut has claimed to have said so much at a private girls' school when he gave a commencement address. Things are going to get unimaginably worse, and they are never, ever going to get better again. Reference 5. I know it is not exactly what you wanted to hear. The rising unemployment levels of the past years could be just the tip of a huge iceberg, and we all could be riding a 21st century economic titanic. I would like to believe that this is merely unjustified pessimism, but beliefs are heavily influenced by emotions, and the truth does not care what we believe. 
It just is. So, how should we approach this conundrum? Will you be the eternal optimist, having faith in the power of the market to adjust itself every time there is a new challenge? Or will you be the incorrigible pessimist, who believes we are doomed and there is no hope left? Which side will you take? You see, I do not think it is a matter of picking sides, or beliefs, or gut feeling. I would like to take an objective position as much as possible. I believe in good data and good logic to interpret that data. I think we should cast aside our ideologies, our personal hunches, and we should use our reason to try and predict the future from an informed perspective. If we want to do that, we are going to have to explore a few things first. These are not difficult ideas. In fact, once explained properly, they are quite simple. But they are also remarkably useful and amazing tools that help us understand the world around us better. Believe it or not, these tools are so basic that they could be easily taught in elementary schools, yet I met many college graduates who failed to apply them at the most fundamental level. Obviously, it is not because these people are not smart enough to understand them, but because they have never been taught to think about the future using these tools. I will try to explain these ideas to the best of my ability. If I succeed, you will be able to grasp these concepts quite easily, and with them, you will see the world from a whole different perspective. You will have all the necessary tools to approach this challenging task, and make up your own mind about which side of the debate you should take. From there, we will take off, think about the future, and see how to live better accordingly. Let's get started. Chapter 3. Exponential Growth One of the most important yet misunderstood concepts in our lives is the nature of the exponential function. You may have heard of this term before. Maybe it was mentioned in some newspaper article in the technology section, briefly cited and hardly explained at all. Or perhaps under the name compound interest when you took out a loan from your bank. Of course, they usually tend to gloss over its real significance, and rarely does someone explain what it really means. Yet it pervades every facet of our lives, the economy, and the decisions we will have to make in the future. Understanding the power of the exponential function is key in proceeding further with the analysis presented in this book. Albert Bartlett, Professor Emeritus of Physics at University of Colorado Boulder, during a very famous lecture he gave, stated that, the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. Reference 1. This is no light statement. Professor Bartlett has lectured over 1,600 times since 1969 on arithmetic, population, and energy, trying to warn as many people as possible about the dangers in failing to understand this most important concept. Before the end of this chapter, I want you to have a clear understanding of the exponential function. It does not matter whether you have a degree in philosophy, in economics, or if you are a college dropout, if you are uneducated, unemployed, if you are a professor at a university, or the CEO of a multinational corporation. Chances are you do not fully understand what exponential growth really means. Yet, it is imperative that you do. I've given many lectures during my life to all kinds of audiences. Even among the most educated ones, people fell short when confronted with the very simple examples of exponential growth. However, when properly explained, everyone was able to understand it. This gives me hope, because it is crucial that everybody realizes what it means and what the consequences are of applying steady exponential growth in the years to come. Enough with my ramblings. Are you ready? Good. Let us dig in and see what it is all about. The exponential function is used to describe the size of anything growing steadily over time. For example, suppose you have to buy a house, and the bank gives you a loan at 7% interest. What it means is that every year, the amount of money you have to give back grows by 7%. The first year, the quantity grows by a tiny amount, turning the debt to a total of 107% of the principal. But on the second year, it grows relative to the last amount, not to the original principal. So, 7% of 107%. The following year, it grows even more, and so it goes. Can you guess what will the amount be in 20 years? Not too easy, unless you have taken statistics in college. It is not my intention to explore the mathematics of the exponential function, although it is really interesting, and I suggest that some of you do. 
I want you to understand it in very clear and effective terms, so I will give you a simple formula that you can use anytime, anywhere, and all you need is first grade math. If you want to know how long it will take to double any quantity that grows at a fixed rate, take the number 70 and divide it by the rate of growth, reference 2. This is called the doubling time. Doubling time equals 70 divided by rate of constant growth. Let us go back to our example. Growth was 7% per year. It did not sound too impressive before, did it? Now, take 70 divided by 7, it gives us 10. That means that circa every 10 years, the amount of money we owe to the bank will double. That looked easy enough, did it not? Well, that is because it is. It is a simple calculation, one that a 10-year-old can do without breaking a sweat. And yet most politicians, policymakers, urban planners, and economists worldwide fail to understand it. To be fair, any economist must have taken a statistics course at university, and the rule of 70, or one of its variations, reference 3, is widely known among academics, so they know about it. But while the calculation may be easy to do, the implications of doubling over time are far less obvious and very misunderstood. So far, we have seen what it takes to double the principal. Now let us explore the effect of this doubling over time. Suppose we borrowed $100,000 from the bank at 7% interest. As we have seen before, in just 10 years we will owe $200,000, or doubling the principal. But how about in 20 years? It will not be $300,000, but instead $400,000, which is two times the previous amount of $200,000, which was itself twice the principal. How about in 30 years? You got it. $800,000. Ten more years, it is already $1.6 million. A few more years and you will owe more than you could ever make in your entire life. Luckily, most loans do not exceed the 30-year mark. But what would happen for other things, things that are not mortgage loans, and that may grow far more than 30 years? Buckle your seatbelt, because we are just getting started. Section 3.1. Explosive Power The idea of exponential growth is not new at all. In fact, it goes back thousands of years. Legend has it that when the creator of the game of chess, some say it was an ancient Indian mathematician, reference 4, showed his invention to the ruler of the country, the king was so pleased that he gave the inventor the right to name his prize for the invention. The man, who was very wise, asked the king this, that for the first square of the chessboard he would receive one grain of wheat, two for the second one, four for the third one, and so on, doubling the amount each time. The king, who had no idea of the power of the exponential function, quickly accepted the inventor's offer, even getting offended by his perceived notion that the inventor was asking for such a low prize, and ordered the treasurer to count and hand over the wheat to the inventor. Few days pass by, the inventor receives only a handful of grains, and the king is somewhat baffled. After a week, the inventor started bringing home big bags of wheat. A few days after that, you see where this is going, right? We start with one, the next day we double, so we have two grains. The next day is four grains, then eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512. In just 10 days, we went from one to 1,024 grains. 10 doublings gave you a 1,000 fold increase from the original amount. Here's where things start to take off. 10 more doublings, and you have 1 million grains. 10 more, 1 billion grains. Then 1 trillion. We can stop right there. We already passed the limit of our brain. Figure 1.1 is a graphical representation to describe the process. Reference 5. On the entire chessboard, there would be 2 to the 64 minus 1, equaling 18 quintillion 446 quadrillion 744 trillion, 73 billion, 709 million, 551,615 grains of wheat, weighing 461 billion, 168 million, 602,000 metric tons. That must be a lot of wheat. But just how much wheat are we talking about? More than the king could afford, I can tell you that. In fact, it would be a heap of wheat larger than Mount Everest, Earth's highest mountain, with a peak 
at 8,848 meters, or 29,029 feet, above sea level. This is around 1,000 times the global production of wheat in 2010, which was 464 million metric tons. That is a lot of wheat. It might very well be more than the entire production of wheat in the history of humanity combined. As impressive and incredible as it may sound, we have to remember that this is not just an intriguing fairy tale that we like to tell. It is not merely an intellectual curiosity. It is a story that helps us understand the world around us, and make predictions about how we should go about building our future. Over the past three years, I have given a number of talks, and often I like to play a little game with the audience, to test their comprehension of an exponential increase. Most people do not get it right away, even among the most educated of audiences, so do not feel bad if it does not come to you on the spot. Imagine an empty glass of water. Technically, a glass is made of glass and is full of air, but please bear with the limitations of our language. Place some bacteria inside and let them replicate by giving them food. The replication process is such that the number of bacteria doubles every minute. After 60 minutes, the glass is full, and since there is no more space left for food, the bacteria die. The question is, what percentage of the glass did the bacteria fill after 55 minutes? Figure 1.2. On the left, at minute zero, there are no bacteria in the glass. On the right, after a certain amount of doublings, the bacteria filled the whole thing. But what happens at minute 55 in the center? How much would you say? Take a pencil and paper to scribble, sketch, and do some calculations. The answer will be in a minute, but I strongly encourage you to have fun and try it out for yourself first. Scribble, sketch, and have fun! I hope you did try to solve it yourself, because learning is so much more fulfilling when it is interactive. If you did not, too bad for you. In truth, the bacteria have only filled 3.125% of the glass. But how can this be? Well, it is simple. If they double every minute, and they fill the entire glass in 60 minutes, then they will have filled half the glass the minute before 60, or 50% after 59 minutes. Half of that the minute before 59, or 25% after 58 minutes, and so on. Table 1.1 summarizes the last 10 minutes, starting from the end. At 60 minutes, 100% of the glass is filled. At 59 minutes, 50%. 58 minutes, 25%. 57 minutes, 12.5%. 56 minutes, 6.25%. 55 minutes, 3.125%. 54 minutes, 1.563%, 53 minutes, 0.781%, 52 minutes, 0.391%, 51 minutes, 0.195%. It all makes sense now, right? Suddenly it becomes clear, even obvious. Who could not get this? It is so simple, right? Apparently it is not. The most common replies I get are between 50% and 90%. Even college graduates typically get it wrong. And let us not talk about politicians. We will come back to this in the appendix, with some real-world examples. For now, I think it is safe to say that we all understand what steady growth means. Let's now see how this applies to our main focus in the next chapter, Information Technology. Chapter 4, Information Technology. Now that we have a solid understanding of the exponential function, we can begin to look at things from a more informed perspective. You may have heard of Moore's Law, which states that the number of transistors that can be placed on an integrated circuit doubles approximately every two years. This effectively means that computer power doubles every 24 months or so. When Gordon E. Moore, co-founder of Intel Corporation, the world's largest semiconductor chip manufacturer, described this trend in his famous 1965 paper, Reference 1, people were very skeptical. He noticed that the number of components in integrated circuits had doubled every year from the invention of the integrated circuit in 1958 until 1965, and predicted that the trend would continue for at least 10 years. Many did not believe him. They said it was an inaccurate prediction. We could not expect it to grow any further due to various technical problems. 
those skeptics were wrong. In fact, it has been doubling steadily for more than 50 years, without any sign of stopping. But Moore's Law is not the whole story. The exponential expansion of technology has been growing remarkably smoothly for a much longer time, and integrated circuits are just a tiny fraction of the whole spectrum of change that pervades technological advancement. Ray Kurzweil notes, reference 2, that Moore's Law of Integrated Circuits was not the first, but rather the fifth paradigm to provide accelerating price performance. Computing devices have been consistently multiplying in power per unit of time, from the mechanical calculating devices used in the 1890 U.S. Census, to Turing's relay-based bomb machine that cracked the Nazi Enigma code, to the CBS vacuum tube computer that predicted the election of Eisenhower, to the transistor-based machines used in the first space launches, to the integrated circuit-based personal computer which Kurzweil used to dictate the very essay that described this phenomenon in 2001. To get an idea of what exponential growth means, look at the following graph, which represents the difference between a linear trend and an exponential one. Figure 1.1, the difference between a linear and an exponential curve, courtesy of Ray Kurzweil. As you can see, the exponential trend starts to really take off where the knee of the curve begins. Before that, things do not seem to change significantly. It is just like the story of the chessboard and the king. In the first few days, nothing notable happens. But as soon as the curve kicks in, something dramatic happens, and things go out of control. If we were to plot the same graph on a logarithmic scale, the line representing the exponential trend, which soon got out of control in the first graph, would look much more manageable. On the y-axis, vertical, representing quantity, instead of moving 20, 40, 60, we would move 10, 100, 1000. So, a curve that would normally go right off the ceiling on a linear graph will look like a straight line on a logarithmic plot. You will understand why we utilize logarithms when talking about exponentials, there simply is not enough space to show the curve. What is even more remarkable is that, when Kurzweil plotted the world's fastest calculators on a graph since 1900, he noticed something quite surprising. Remember that a straight line on a logarithmic graph means exponential growth? If you thought exponential growth was fast, you have not seen anything yet. Take a look at this graph. Figure 1.2, the exponential growth of computing power over the last 110 years courtesy of Ray Kurzweil. This plot is logarithmic. You can see the y-axis having the number 10 growing at five orders of magnitude after each step. That is a 100,000-fold increase every time. But the curve is not a straight line. Instead, what you see is an upward trend. What this means is that there is another exponential curve. In other words, there is exponential growth in the rate of exponential growth. Considering what we have just learned about exponential growth, I would say that that is pretty remarkable. Computer speed, per unit cost, doubled every three years between 1910 and 1950, then doubled every two years between 1950 and 1966, and is now doubling every year. Computer power is not simply increasing. It is increasing faster and faster every year. According to the available evidence, we can infer that this trend will continue for the foreseeable future, or at least another 30 years. Eventually, it will hit physical limits imposed by the laws of nature, and its increase will have to slow down. Some suggest that we may be able to circumvent that problem, once the singularity is reached. Technological singularity refers to the time when the speed of technological change is so fast that we are unable to predict what will happen. At that moment, computer intelligence will exceed that of human, and we will not even be able to understand what changes are happening. The term was first coined by science fiction writer Werner Vinge, and subsequently popularized by many authors, predominantly Ray Kurzweil, with his books The Age of Spiritual Machines and The Singularity is Near. This idea, however, is highly speculative, and it is far beyond the purpose of this book to examine its feasibility. Suffice to say that in order for machines to replace most human jobs, the singularity is not a necessary requirement, as we will see in the next chapters. Whether you buy into the singularity argument or not does not matter. The data is clear. 
Facts are facts, and we only have to look a few years into the future to reach conclusions that are alarming enough. The Turing test is a thought experiment proposed in 1950 by the brilliant English mathematician and father of computers, Alan Turing. Imagine you enter a room where a computer sits on top of a desk. You notice there is a chat window and two conversations are open. As you begin to type messages down, you are told you are in fact talking to one person and one machine. You can take as much time as you want to find out which is which. If you are not able to tell the difference between them, the machine is said to have passed the test. There are many variations of the same experiment. You could have more interlocutors, and they could all be machines, or they could all be humans, and you might be tricked into thinking otherwise. Whatever the flavor, the main idea is clear. You conduct conversations through natural language to determine if you are communicating with a human or a computer. The machine able to pass the Turing test is said to have achieved human-level intelligence, or at least perceived intelligence. Whether we consider that to be true intelligence or not is irrelevant for the purpose of the argument. Some people call this strong artificial intelligence, or strong AI, and many see strong AI as an unachievable myth, because the brain is mysterious, and so much more than the sum of its individual components. They claim that the brain operates using unknown, possibly unintelligible quantum mechanical processes, and any effort to reach or even surpass it using mechanical machines is pure fantasy. Others claim that the brain is just a biological machine, not much different than any other machine, and that it is merely a matter of time before we can surpass it using our artificial creations. This is certainly a fascinating topic, one that would require a thorough examination. Perhaps I will explore it in another book. For now, let us concentrate on the present, on what we know for sure, and on the upcoming future. As we will see, there is no need for machines to achieve strong AI in order to change the nature of the economy, employment, and our lives forever. We will start by looking at what intelligence is, how it can be useful, and if machines have become intelligent, perhaps even more so than us. You have been listening to the audiobook of Robots Will Steal Your Job, But That's Okay, written by Federico Pistono, read by Ian R. Buck. This audiobook is a production of The Nexus TV, a network of technology-focused podcasts. Find our other shows at thenexus.tv. This audiobook is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 Unported License, so feel free to use any part of it as long as you link back to the original page. You do not use this for any commercial purposes, and you release your version under the same license. Until next time, have a good one. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence. We're presented with so many choices in our lives. How do we make sure we're making sound decisions? By getting a second opinion from an informed source, of course. Lucky for you, the hosts from across the Nexus use lots of hardware, software, and media and analyze them on our show, Second Opinion. From reviewing the latest phones and laptops to pitting apps against each other, we've got you covered. Find us on our website, thenexus.tv, or by searching for Second Opinion Reviews in your favorite podcast player.